<laughs> Am I on? Yeah. Okay, welcome to the Libido Loco class. So we called it a fun name so people wouldn't be too scared or hesitant to join us in for this topic. So we always do this in February, Valentine's Day, Lover's Day, whatnot. But it's not just about libido. What you're going to learn tonight is a lot about hormone health and even about how well your body handles stress. So that's probably like the biggest libido zapper out there is stress. But what we talk with patients all the time about is that stress happens, right? Life happens and you don't always know or can predict what the next season of life is going to bring. And so what we're trying to do is build up people's ability to adapt to stress so their body will do all these functions that it's supposed to and perform optimally and be healthy and happy and be restful and calm without going into overdrive or having a total like plummet of health or you know having things like spiral downhill quickly. So we're going to talk about hormones and so does anybody know what a hormone is? We talk about hormones all the time. We blame hormones for everything, right women? Yes. Yes we do. We should. We will. <laughs> That's not going to change. Don't we have hormones? Yeah, do you blame things on your hormones? Well, you said women, and 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 uh, I don't know. I'm a little hurt. Don't be hurt. Me to leave? I was picking on women because we do tend to blame our hormones on everything, and I don't hear men do that very often. You know, I you know we we get used to like blaming our cycle on everything. So don't be hurt. It's just that you guys are more stoic. I feel right. You can handle it, or just not talk about it. It might be more of a zip lip thing. So a hormone is actually a chemical messenger in the body. To kind of put it simply, your body relies on these hormones to signal different areas of the body as an instruction code, right? So things have to happen and be interconnected. There's all sorts of things going on behind the scenes that we're not consciously aware of from minute to minute. And the fact is, if you had to be aware of every little chemical messenger and biochemical process and what was going on in the body, it would drive you mad. Like, you wouldn't even be able to put, like, one foot in front of the other, right? Because you just can tune all that out. Thank God, right? We don't have to hear our heartbeat and our lungs inhaling and exhaling and our digestive system moving. Now, sometimes you have some noises, right? <laughs> yeah, but they're not the kind of, like, drive you crazy and are going on and on and on. So it's just simply a chemical messenger, and they're released directly into the bloodstream. So what that means is they're very fast acting. So hormones can change and fluctuate rapidly on a minute by minute, second by second basis. And that's what they're doing. So that's why they can cause all sorts of things in the body. And so men are used to thinking of male, the, big, the biggest male hormone is what? Testosterone. Right, and women are used to thinking of estrogen. maybe two, estrogen. estrogen's the big one, or progesterone, right. But you have several chemical messengers or hormones in the body. So I'm going to teach you a little bit about that because the important theme of tonight is that you can't really affect the health or level of one hormone without affecting the health or the levels of the other hormones. They're all very interconnected, and because they're messengers, they talk to each other right so one effect will cause the other one and sometimes one goes up and the other one goes up and sometimes one goes up and the other one goes down so they can have either relationship okay but the hormones control most of our major body systems and i said that's why they make us so crazy so when i said libido loco do you guys know what loco means not crazy Crazy, nuts, insane in the membrane. See, thank you, I got you. I have all the music references tonight. I'm on a roll now. So when I say that they cause disruption or are interconnected to so many organ systems, they're related to hunger. So did you know that hormones is what makes you feel hungry or can actually make you feel satisfied after eating a meal? So it's a whole bunch of hormones. Um, Definitely reproduction, so that's the one that we all recognize when we said testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, we think of like our reproductive system with hormones. Um, our bones, muscles, and fat growth. Did you know that those things are related to hormones? So things like diseases of those as well, like osteoporosis as the biggest example. Isn't that why they kind of threaten women in menopausal years to go on hormone replacement therapy, right? They tell you that you're going to get brittle bones or osteoporosis. That's kind of one of their biggest 
reasons to sub, um, prescribe, excuse me. So that's because your bones, muscle, and um, bone, muscle, and fat growth are interconnected. And so we said fat, right? So isn't everybody trying to lose fat? And even people who are not trying to lose weight, we definitely know that like increased body fat is related to a whole slew of health risks, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of have this like mentality, like more body fat, more health risks. Um, wake and sleep cycles, that's all related. So if you're having energy issues during the day, if it's hard for you to wake, if you have that mid-afternoon slump, um, or if you're having sleep disturbance where either you can't fall asleep or you crash too early or you fall asleep but then you wake up intermittently in between sleep and then have a difficulty resting or even wake up too early. Um, those are all hormonal cycles in the body. Your metabolism. So we talked a little bit about fat growth. Um, the weight around the middle. Does everybody know what cortisol is? Yeah. So people used to not know, but now people are getting more versed in what cortisol is. So cortisol is a stress hormone, and that's how stress is related to weight. So the tissue that people tend to put on around the middle, like the inner tube, or people start to complain like they lost their waistline and their pants start fitting unusual to them, um, that's related to cortisol. And cortisol is related to insulin. And insulin is related to what? Sugar. Sugar, exactly. So you see how like diet, sugar is related to a hormone, which is related to stress, which is related to weight gain. And that's just one example of the interconnectedness of hormones, okay? Um, so yeah, totally stress. Like we've got patients who they're like, I'm eating clean, their food logs look beautiful. You know, they um, are taking their program and are doing supplementation. That would, doing exercise and working out, maybe even doing keto, seemingly doing all the right things, but still complaining that either they can't lose weight or they've been able to lose some and then their weight loss plateaus, right? So we look at that from a number of different angles. It could be a thyroid disruption, it could be an adrenal disruption, it could be an insulin resistance issue. And so weight gain, for example, would be individual to each person. The solution would be independent of what your unique individual issue is. So there is no one size fits all. And that's kind of a theme with all of our lectures. Have you guys noticed that? You're a little newer to the program. Yeah, that's okay. Welcome. You'll hear me say some of the same themes regardless of what we're, whether we're talking about libido or weight loss or keto or meal prep or headaches or whatever the topic is because that's what we really believe in. There is no one size fits all, right? So people could have hormone imbalance and have maybe the same symptoms. So tonight we're talking about libido, but it could be any one of these chemical messengers that's out of balance, right? Um, so the symptom is just the generic issue. It's a call to action, right? We've said that, it's kind of that red flag. It's the body's way to kind of raise a flag and say, hey, I need attention, I'm not happy. Please help me figure out why. Don't just cover it up with hormones or something. And we'll talk a little bit about the difference in, in a minute more in detail of the medical model of hormone balance versus the natural model of hormone balance. Um, did you know your mood is related to hormones? Mm -hmm. <laughs> your mood is so cute. I wish everybody on camera could see this. We got a mix of like emojis going on. If I could turn all your little faces, your reactions into emojis. I think we covered like all of them. Just turn you guys into little text bubbles. <laughs> yes, we already know that emotions are related to our mood. No kidding. That's why we're here, right? <laughs> They're making us loco. Libido loco. Um, something else that's interesting is your immune system is also related to hormones. So if you're not sleeping well and you're stressed to the max and you're in fight or flight and go mode all the time and you don't take any time to rest and recover and replenish and restore the body and eat right and do all the things you need to do, your immune system's gonna take the brunt of it, right? And then you become more predisposed to colds and the flu and all the stuff that, the ick that's out there. We just call it ick in general, right? Don't get the ick, stay out of the ick. Right, hair, skin, and nails. So we did a whole lecture, um, I think 
remember on Mother's Day we did the hair, skin, and nails lecture. So you can actually go back and watch that on the YouTube channel. Um, but we talked about the interconnectedness of hormones and hair, skin, and nails. So one thing that we always kind of taunt patients with when they're new is that one day, once we kind of uncover all these priorities and layers in the body, you'll become a wellness patient. And then we can have some fun with more of the cosmetic stuff, you know? So we get your adrenals balanced and your hormones in balance. And then we can talk about like hair, skin, nails, cellulite, some additional weight loss, those types of things. But it's usually related to hormones. Growth and development, so think of little kiddos, right? The kids that are delayed, they've got some pituitary signaling issues. Um, they put kids on growth hormone, right? You've heard of growth hormone, right? So as we get older, we actually produce less growth hormone and that can cause us to age. It can cause us to be more predisposed to inflammation and chronic disease processes. So that's what all these body hackers are trying to do, you know, that are busting the keto code and figuring out, you know, how to improve performance with the proper diet and getting us out of, for example, glucose metabolism, burning sugar for energy into more ketones, is that they're really trying to figure out how to increase some of those growth hormones that we had naturally as a child to prevent disease and help with bodybuilding, you know, if we want to increase like lean muscle mass, so your muscular development and that kind of thing. I don't know why I'm touching my arm like there's muscles there. <laughs> so weird. I can move my arm, therefore there's muscles. Did you know that? <laughs> they might not be bulgy, but they're there. And your, your body temperature. So that's a big complaint that we get. People are either cold all the time or they're hot all the time or they're both and they're flashing between the two and super uncomfortable regardless of what environment they're in. So that it can be really injured. And it doesn't have to be hot flashes or night sweats. I think we're, we know about those type of perimenopause and menopausal symptoms, um, but it could just be in general like hot all the time or generally cold all the time kind of kind of an issue, or intolerant to temperature changes is what we'll hear, right? And that's actually on our new patient paperwork because we know if somebody marks that, that we're gonna be looking at one of these hormone systems, okay? So what I wrote on the next um, little paragraph here is just kind of a lot of words. These, just to show you, you don't have to be an anatomy expert, but just to show you that there's a number of endocrine glands. So your endocrine system is the system that makes hormones, okay? Have you guys heard the word endocrine and not really maybe known what in the world that meant? Or maybe you did. Good. So the endocrine system is made up of all these words that I don't want to confuse you with. You might have heard of some, you might not have heard of others, but we talked about that they're all interconnected and in balance with each other. So for example, you can't change the hormones in the brain without changing the hormones in your reproductive system. But you can't change the hormones in your pancreas for insulin and blood sugar regulation without changing your thyroid feedback, you know, um, output, for example. So doesn't that start, start to be kind of interesting? So with that said, if your hormones are related to hunger and metabolism and stress and mood and immune and all the things that we mentioned, can you imagine what the symptoms of hormone imbalance, how widespread that could be? So that, I just kind of gave you a list. We talked through some of these points as I was doing the little box above with you, but it could be anywhere from, you know, having irregular menstrual cycles or infertility for women all the way to mood disorders like anxiety and depression. It could be, you know, somebody who's susceptible to colds and flu and getting sick or not recovering very well. It could be somebody who's stressed out of their mind and not responding or even finds themselves a little more short-tempered or, you know, easily triggered from normal everyday stresses, whether it's workplace or family stress or traffic stress. Has anybody done that? Like, do like kind of a self-check and like, Okay, I know that the driver was insane, but I don't know why, like, I had to get so worked up. Or, you know, like, after the stressors, like, removed, and you're like, okay, you realize, like, all right, that was silly, I'm not really in danger, it wasn't life-threatening. But, like, your heart is still beating, and you're like, okay, like, shake it off, but you can't shake it off. Have you ever felt that way? Yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday? <laughs> I know, right? Do you want to talk about it? No. <laughs> we'll create, I know, we'll create a buddy system after, we can all, like... <laughs> 
fighting option, just do five minutes of like complaint. <laughs> to get it all off your chest. It'd be nice, right? I always say like we should have a like national tell the truth day where we don't have to like soften the blow or like cover up our feelings or you know, like you know, yeah. just say it like it is. But I feel like that might cause a war, so <laughs> nobody's done it yet. If we could get everybody's hormones balanced, we could have national tell the truth day. But until then, I don't recommend it. Yeah, you gotta know your audience for that, right? Um and so you guys kind of see it, like brain fog, concentration, body aches and pains, you name it. So when I start going through this list and now go back to the fact that I told you that this is libido loco lecture, are any of those symptoms super sexy? No, not really. Do they make you feel sexy or attractive or in the mood in any way, shape, or form? Mm -hmm. Heck no, but does all the ads and commercials have you believing that this is a disease, that you know you should be in the mood and on call like 24 seven or else there's something wrong with you, right? It's not true, you guys. Our bodies are stressed and taxed to the max. And so there's a lot of things that we can do to get it in balance because what happens is, even though we might not treat libido directly in the practice, what I can tell you is every time, if your physical health can come up, your emotional health will come right up alongside of it. And you'll feel more like a human being, and you'll be more in tune with your body's innate processes, and libido will come forth, and you will feel like spreading love. But until then, <laughs> until then, you're just gonna be like, back away, right? I know. So just think of it, like go through the list, like anxiety, not sexy, heart palpitations, not sexy, feeling tired, not sexy. None of this is sexy. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what is libido. So just not even to make it funny or awkward or anything, like a medical definition is it's your personal over, overall sexual drive. And what it's right in the dictionary is that it's influenced by biological, so we just talked about the anatomy of your endocrine or hormonal system, so a lot of biology. Psychological, so not only what's happening in your world and emotional stressors, but how do you react to that? And also, what does your self-talk sound like? And who are you surrounding yourself by? And what is their chatter at you all day putting in your brain and making you think and repeat, right? So you're gonna have to look at like who you're surrounding yourself by too. And then social factors. And I just mentioned commercials in general as one thing, you know, kind of telling us we all have hormone imbalance and we all are diseased if we're not like, on call, right? <laughs> so that's one example of a social factor. Um, the medical model versus the wellness model. So now we kind of understand hormones and the endocrine system and what the definition of libido is. So what you guys would be some of the medical model treatments for lack of libido or drive? Any ideas? Not a shrink. A shrink, that's true. Viagra, maybe Hormone counseling. Replacement Hormone replacement therapy. Healthy eating. Healthy eating. That would be if you have an enlightened doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So that's what some of the things are. They would treat the symptoms of low drive. And so that's what Viagra, the little purple pill, or the hormone replacement, even bioidentical. Have you guys heard that word? Mm -hmm. So bioidentical are sold to you as more natural than the synthetic over-the-counter hormones. What I'll tell you is that it's still kind of overdriving your natural hormone processes. So I'm gonna kind of contrast that with the um, wellness model in a minute, but regardless of what type of hormones you're putting in the body, it's replacing your hormones. So when you take a hormone into the body, whether it's synthetic, if it's a pill, if it's a cream, or if it's a sublingual tablet, or it's an actual injectable, what happens is the body recognizes it and it starts to do the work that your lack of natural hormones would have done, right? It's replacing hormones. And so that will make your hormone levels look better on your blood work, right? You'll pass your blood test. but. Do you think that it's doing anything to rebuild the body? Like, what do you think about that? I know you're all my patients, so you're smart. Is it confusing the body then? 
She asked, is it confusing the body? It is confusing the body in a sense because let's use the thyroid, for example, because everybody understands that. If you take thyroid hormone, your thyroid will start to relax, like recognize the thyroid hormone and all the other endocrine systems will also pick up that there's thyroid hormone circulating in the bloodstream and they'll all respond and react accordingly. So there's a little bit of confusion there because the other endocrine organs think that there's thyroid hormone. Now if you stop taking the thyroid hormone, the thyroid still doesn't know how to work. And so it didn't solve the problem. It didn't restore or rebuild the thyroid at all. And in fact, it can actually make the thyroid lazy because it starts doing the work for the gland and then the thyroid didn't know how to work. Go ahead. But, but thyroid replacement is extremely uh, common. I it mean, is extremely my wife common. now, my ex, she yeah. had a part yeah. of it re removed, uh, and I think I know of other people. Oh, yeah. And the fact of the matter is, he was saying that the thyroid hormone replacement therapy is very common. It's actually becoming more common in younger and younger generations as well. Like That's we're seeing scary. children who are coming up with thyroid. And some of the people that I know who have had their thyroid radiated, for example, for like hyperthyroid, um, which is irreversible, just so you know, um, they were in their teens when they had it done. So yeah, it's an epidemic. I'm doing a talk, I'm gonna tell you guys about the um, Women's Expo in a little bit, but we're doing a talk on just exactly that, yeah. So you're right, it's truly, it's truly very, very um, common. Now there are cases, like we talked about, if somebody had a thyroidectomy, like their thyroid was removed for cancer or something like that, or they um, had the thyroid radiated, their body's not gonna produce thyroid hormones. So those are not the cases that I'm talking about. But there are things naturally that can be done to rebuild and improve the health of the thyroid so that it'll make its own hormone so you don't need to give the body replacement therapy. So that would be the better scenario or situation. So what is the mechanism? How do you do it? Uh-huh. Well, I'm gonna tell you. Okay. Yeah, I will tell it. Um, so the medical model, I want to keep going on this theme of what's not sexy for a minute, okay? So this is not sexy. The side effects of some of these Viagra pills and hormone replacement therapy is blindness. Not sexy? No. You guys can say it with me. Uh, hearing loss. Not, not sexy. sexy. What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> I got another one. The guys should shout not sexy super loud on this one. Penile amputation. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Nobody said That's anything. That's more scary than anything. anything. <laughs> never sexy and never going to be sexy ever again, right? <laughs> so there's actually a side effect of that, you guys, because it can cause prolonged er erection and it actually can strangulate your own anatomy to the point where they've had to am amputate it. Like men end up in the emergency room for these things. I'm not telling you that to be a fear tactic, but you have to know this stuff. Like these things are handed out like, you know, just like candy and people don't ask. And so all I'm asking you is to think and to be knowledgeable and so that you can make an educated decision. And I think that the data will speak for itself and by empowering you and, you know, educating you, you'll be better able to make a good decision for your body, right? And everybody's like, oh, well, it's such a low risk or, what, that's what we hear, like, oh, you know, it never happens. They just have to put it on a label. Well, what if you're the one person out of a thousand that it happens to? That's the thing, like, yeah, it might be a super low risk until you're the one. That's what I say. Okay. Um, so also some of those medications can cause, like, a sudden decrease in blood pressure. Has anybody ever had a low blood pressure? Do you know what that feels like? Mm -hmm. Not sexy, right? <laughs> you feel like you're sick or you're gonna pass out or ill. Um, also, heart attack type symptoms, so it could either drop your blood pressure or you could actually have like heart palpitations and feel like really racy, um, or have chest pains, that's the things that have been um, reported. And difficulty breathing. That's not really not sexy. Not sexy. And hives. Definitely not sexy. Itchy, bumpy, <laughs> not sexy, right? Okay. So, does anybody want to go on the medical model? No. Okay. Right. 
Pass. Okay, they said pass. So let's go on and tell you what else you could possibly do to improve your libido as well as balance your hormones naturally. So the first thing in the wellness model would be to find the individual person's underlying reason for the hormone imbalance. So we always need to kind of step back and not just assess the symptoms, but ask the question, why? And that's really when we talk about functional medicine or alternative medicine or um, natural medicine or wellness mm -hmm. medicine, it's really about asking the question why to get to the underlying root of each person's individual condition, regardless of what the symptom would be. So the causes of low libido can vary from person to person. It can range from hormone imbalance. We talked about stress. It could just be a circulatory issue. So that's why a lot of those, um, a lot of the side effects of some of the Viagra and hormone replacement therapy sound like cardiovascular issues, right? Like the drop in blood pressure or heart attack type symptoms or um, like the strangulation because it increases blood flow too much. That's what those medicines are, you, are used for, is to increase circulation. So um, just circulatory problems in, in general, uh, blood sugar imbalances. So people have um, elevated or real low blood sugars that can cause, the, um, can cause libido issues. Um, we named the thyroid gland. So either when you start to listen to or look up symptoms of each of the glands, like hypo or hyperthyroid or hypo or hyperadrenal, it all starts blending together like a hodgepodge. Like you're just like, okay, this all sounds like the same. So that's because an increase or decrease in one of the hormones, because it affects all the other, they'll all, you know, kind of counterbalance each other, could cause an increase or decrease of symptoms too. So it's not all just straight cookie cutter. Has anybody ever heard of adrenal fatigue? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Who in here has ever taken an adrenal supplement? Mm -hmm. Most people. And I call this practice, it's called Health by Design, some there, but it should be called the Adrenal Club. <laughs> <laughs> so we just welcome people to the club when they come in for their new patient appointment and the adrenal shows up as their priority. I'm like, yeah, you're in the club. And we slap five and I'm like, I see you because thyroid. I was adrenal for a while and then once adrenal got cleared, thyroid. So it makes sense. And I'll always kind of talk about this with patients. There's like this whole dichotomy in even the nutritional world where like I've heard 50% of nutritionists say you have to get the adrenal well before you get the thyroid well. And the other half is like, no, you have to start with the thyroid in order to get the adrenals balanced. Well, they're both right. It just depends on the individual. Like some people's priority is their thyroid while other people's priority is their adrenal. So both are right, but without what we do, you know, without muscle testing, I don't know how they figure out, maybe by trial and error, I'm not sure. But we can do it with our technology here to identify right away if it's thyroid or adrenal that needs the attention and then see everything kind of balanced out as a result of their program. Uh, liver toxicity. So what do you guys think of when I say liver? Alcohol. Alcohol, yeah. So what is alcohol a form of? Sugar. Sugar, true. Sugar breaks, um, alcohol breaks down into sugar. Detox, right? We always talk about liver detox. Most people have heard of something like that. Your liver actually is where hormones are produced and they are from the cholesterol. So cholesterol is formed in the liver and then it uses the cholesterol and the body, you know, all these endocrine organs use the cholesterol to manufacture hormones. So if your liver is congested and isn't detoxifying properly, it's going to impact the health of your organs. So that's why when people are on certain medications, they always have to monitor the health of your liver. Like you have to go in regularly to see if it's elevating your liver hormones because it actually can cause toxicity. And I will tell you too, like people that are lowering their cholesterol way low with statin medications, when you get the cholesterol to a critically low point, like we had somebody today, his cholesterol is 143. So his medical doctor, in my opinion, and a lot of people who do what I do and are on this side of the fence, would say that that's dangerously low because you need, you need the, the cholesterol to make hormones. And you also need cholesterol for your nervous system in your brain. And so what happens is people take these medications 
their cholesterol gets critically low, then they have liver toxicity, then they end up on Viagra or hormone replacement therapy because their hormones are whacked out, and then they eventually end up with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. or some kind of, you know, uh, memory or dementia issues. Mm -hmm. Is any of that story. sexy? I know. That's not a bedtime story. I know. <laughs> Did somebody tell you that I we were doing that? I know what bedtime stories are. That's I know. This is like a horror movie, right? <laughs> it's a horror movie. Maybe we'll all hold hands and sing Libido Loco at the end. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, no. You can leave before we sing. <laughs> He's like, peace out. <laughs> I get it. I get it. You've never heard me sing, though. It could be amazing. <laughs> Okay, so where are we? Wait, there's got to be some good news in here somewhere, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> from the back row, yes. Um, side effects from medication, we can deal with the side effects. So sometimes medications, there is a proper time and place for medications, right? There are emergency situations. There are times when we need critical care, and we're blessed and lucky to live in America where we have access to good medical care and all the technology and all that, and our, you know, all that. But is medication often the first, you know, too frequently recommended and not maybe the last resort? Sure it is. So if that's what we're talking about. We're not telling people to be irresponsible with their health or avoid it altogether. You just have to use both responsibly and learn what's capable. And doing something like a wellness model is to prevent the need for excessive intervention in medical care. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So let them do the sick care when we get broken and when we have crisis and when we need life-saving. That's great. That's what the medical model is awesome for. But what happens until you're sick? Right? Mm -hmm. So nobody really thinks about that. We think that our only option sometimes is wait until we get inevitable illness and then pour on the heroics. But if you could do a little bit of preventative wellness model stuff and learn some of these tactics and foods and supplements and lifestyle modification along the way, you can prolong or maybe even avoid, you know, some of the heroics. So you don't have to be a statistic is what we say. And just because somebody in your family or your genetic line had whatever name you know, fill in the blank condition, doesn't mean that you have to have it. Because what we know is genes are influenced by lifestyle, they're influenced by our health and diet and nutrition, and so you can turn those genetic factors on or off like little light switches. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. You can change your genetic code. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's not in a commercial anywhere, is it? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It's not what's blasted through the mainstream. Um, emotional health. So I'm not a counselor, I'm not a shrink, you probably already know that. I'd probably be a really terrible one, don't you think? <laughs> you don't think so? I'd be like, look! <laughs> so we do have a couple of people that we can refer out to. Um, we actually are going to air a similar lecture on this as a follow-up after Valentine's Day. Um, we have Mary Whitman Ortiz. I've got a couple of her books here. She's got a great um, Facebook page. She lectures around the area. Um, she's an author now. And so we've got some of her like good tactics and skills and, you know, I don't know. I'll let her talk about it. So we'll be online together on a Facebook Live. You'll see. Um, watch your emails because we'll send you out the dates. And her and I will be kind of doing a body-mind lecture where I'll talk about the anatomy and how to heal you physically. And she'll talk about the mind and the psychological aspects in a very healthy way and non-confrontational. Like, she's really easy to talk to. And then self-esteem is a big thing. So when people come in... You know, again, without being a shrink or a psychiatrist or a counselor, we dig a little bit when people give us our health, their health history. Like, oh, I want to lose weight. Okay, well, tell me a little bit about why. Like, what does that look like in your life? And a lot of times it comes down with how you feel about yourself, you know, and how you fit in your clothes and whether you feel comfortable in your own skin. And so there might be health risks and symptoms related to it, but sometimes it just comes down to, like, it just doesn't make you feel good about yourself you know, or you're worried about the way you look or some of these other factors. So self-esteem could be a huge issue that needs to be addressed. 
So we always talk about health as a body, mind, spirit. It's multifaceted, right? There's no one answer for every single person. So we're going to talk about um, some of the foods to avoid. So these are foods that have been shown to be libido zappers. And then I'm going to give you a list of foods that have been shown to improve mood and libido. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about just foods in general for hormone balance and then get you thinking more about what's the real solution for all of this stuff. Does that sound good? Does that sound more like a bedtime story? See, I always frame my lectures the same. I give you all the bad news and the stats and the data because I want you to think, why are we talking about this in the first place? Why is it important? How does it pertain to me? And then I give you some of the solutions after the fact so you can feel empowered and know that there are things that are in your control that you can do. Okay. So guess what's the number one with Vito Zapper? Yes. Sugar. It's sugar! <laughs> Doesn't sugar make us crazy? Think of how crazy we are for sugar. People are out of their minds for sugar. They're addicted to sugar. And people know that and they put sugar in everything because they've got you like reeled in. I don't know how to fish, so. <laughs> yeah. Close. I know. If I put my paper down, I guess it's yeah. probably better. Um, yeah, sugar, and it's because it's inflammatory, and so it causes, like, all the hormones, every organ, every cell, to be inflamed and angry and freaking out. Wow. I know. It's powerful, right? It's powerful. Has anybody been to our class when we do the sugar quiz and you see the 142 reasons why sugar is ruining your health handout? Mm -hmm. So if you go back and look at it, you're going to see all sorts of hormone imbalance issues on there. You're going to see everything that we listed on page one as far as like the signs and symptoms of hormone imbalance listed on the sugar sheet. Um, low fat diets. So the low fat diets is because you don't have the fat molecules to make hormones. You actually need fat and fat soluble vitamins to make hormones. So that all those old like low fat diets and all the low fat and people are still afraid of fat. That's why it's critical to be on fat. And we are not proponents that all fat is equal, right? So I'm not talking about, you know, unhealthy fats or high fat like McDonald's type stuff or you know over-the-counter sweets and things that you typically associate with fat that's why people are like oh my gosh I can't believe you're telling me to eat fat we're talking about avocado and coconut oil and olives and you know salmon and fresh fish and grass-fed if you're doing meat grass-fed beef and the, the quality of the proteins has a lot to do with then just what's identifying what food item you're eating okay so does that make a little bit more sense when I say fat? Okay, good. Toxins and poor digestion. So if your body can't digest and incorporate the foods properly, so if you have GI issues, um, you can bet that your hormones are out of balance because you actually manufacture, they, they did this, they studied the gut and they studied the brain. Have you heard of the gut is for second brain? Yeah. So the reason why they're saying that is because they're finding that you produce more hormones in your gut than you actually produce in your brain. More neuro, nor, neuro hormones. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So that can affect your mood and your libido and your feel good and your self-esteem and your get up and go. Like all of that, right? Um, toxins, of course, through the liver. So we talked about the liver hormone cholesterol connection, right? Um, food preservatives, so one big one is BHA. Um, the problem with food preservatives, like we have a whole reading labels class coming up next Wednesday um, with Joni, our newest associate. That's a great one if you haven't been to it yet. Um, she's going to tell you more about what some of these crazy hidden things are on your label, but sometimes it doesn't just say like BHA, like spelled out like that, right? So they hide it in with all these like crazy, or they might tell you what BHA stands for and you just kind of like, I don't know how to even say that and your brain just skips over it and then you just ignore it, right? Um, red food dye. Does anybody give me an idea of what has red food dye in it? Cherries. Skittles. <laughs> Cherry flavored stuff, yeah, like the red Skittles. Any other examples of what has red food dye in it? Red velvet. Kool Aid. Red velvet cake. Uh, red velvet cake. Jello. Jello. <laughs> Jello. Skittles. What about ketchup? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. You gotta look, not all ketchup. So that's why when we do our grocery store tour, we always show you there is organic ketchup that is made out of tomatoes and vinegar and spices. 
But yes, you have to read your labels on condiments and seasonings and sauces. For some reason in this country, we have decided that things should be fluorescently bright and brilliantly colored, like our jewelry. It tastes good. I don't know why. I like our lipstick. I don't know. Lipstick. Our makeup. We should have. A, we have a talks on hair, skin, and nails and the makeup and what we put on our body, not only what we put in our body. So red dye for sure. All your red lips, right? Red lips are sexy, aren't they? They could be. If they're not late in with time. And there are natural, there are natural beauty products that we could discuss with you guys too. Um, plastics. So, do you guys know what plastics do to your hormones? Think way back. Dig through those memory banks. They mimic hormones? They mimic hormones, exactly. Good job. I knew that from before. She's <laughs> been to classes with me before, right? So yeah, they they disrupt the endocrine. They're actually in a category called endocrine disruptors, and it's because they mimic our natural hormones, um, and especially estrogen. So women understand, you know, all these estrogen positive cancers and estrogen associated disorders. So the plastic water bottles have to go. Sorry. What about Ziploc bags? Ziploc bags, um, the containers, plastic containers. So is there a, a safe plastic? Well. So, I know that is a really good question. So, everybody knows BPA is bad, right? So, you have all these BPA free products now. Well, what they didn't tell you is they replaced the BPA with BPB and BPC and BPD. I don't know if those are the actual right acronyms, but there's other BP. So, they haven't yet been linked to any kind of endocrine. They can't tell you that it causes cancer or endocrine because they're new. They just made them to replace the old ones. But what oh. chemists are telling us is that they're just as dangerous, if not more dangerous. Wow. And they're doing it in kids, like babies' toys and stuff, too. So, it's kind of... So, no big. plastic? Just forget about plastic? Yeah, so glass containers, um, that's a lot better. And sometimes, like, people will just kind of slowly phase their stuff out. But you can go to, like, Best... Not Best Buy. Um, Bed Bath & Beyond or one of the box stores, like Costco or BJ's or something. And they have, like, sets, like a, you know, starter set with all different, like, um, sizes for the glass containers. Okay. So that's easy. Those water bottles that we get at the Mountain Valley Springs are in glass. They are 16 pounds each. So if you order that water, which I recommend you do, um, you have to have somebody who can hoist it up onto there. Uh, which I know I have muscles, speaking of that, because I can do it. I just have a spotter with me so we don't break it and have like five gallons of water flooding our office. That would be bad. Um, xenoestrogens is what we're talking about kind of with the plastics. But xenoestrogens are also in a lot of the products we use on our body like cosmetics, pesticides, not only pesticides that are in our foods and in our clothing as well. Um, nail polish, uh, sunscreen and then also growth hormones that are in meat and poultry. And so that's why we tell you that you have, you really have to get organic for any of the animal type products that you're using because it has hormones as well as pesticides. It's got both, and both are on the list here as far as endocrine disruptors. Alcohol is sexy, right? Most people use alcohol to get in the mood all the time. Because you know alcohol actually doesn't make you sleep better, it actually causes more disrupted sleep. And it breaks down into sugar, which makes the liver go into overdrive, which disrupts your chemical hormones. Quantify that. Quantify how much? Yeah. Like how much alcohol? It really depends on the person, again. You know how we Take do like our little person, food block? Which, which doesn't exist. Well, if I have a patient with cancer, then I'm saying zero, right? So if they're to the point where their bodies had so much inflammation and endocrine disruption and some of these hormone positive type cancers and I'm telling them zilch right if somebody's just wanting to lose weight and they want to drink socially then maybe a couple of drinks a week but there's like I'm not I couldn't tell you you know there's research that shows if you have um, a glass of wine every day that it increases your um, risk of breast cancer and I don't know what the number but significantly yeah so, and all those studies about red wine as yeah. part of the Mediterranean diet? I know. There's, I'll tell you what, there's research for and against anything. 
somebody says you need to drink eight ounces of water and somebody comes out with research that says, no, you only need one, you don't need that much water. Somebody comes out and says butter is good for you and somebody's like, oh no, you gotta do margarine, which we know is totally false, you guys, right? So somebody says eggs are fine, they don't raise cholesterol and then somebody else says, oh no, egg yolks are terrible for you. You know what I mean? So is a Mediterranean diet better and been linked to health? Yes, but is it all the lack of processed foods and sugars and chemicals and fresh produce and olives and oils and healthy fats that's causing it, you know, their health stats to be better, or is it actually the red wine? The red wine. You he knows it. There's no doubt about it. He knows it's red wine. Well, the cool thing is, young, but you <laughs> we have a resident expert in the house. So just ask him all your alcohol questions. I love it. I know my grandpa made red wine his whole life, you know, and they lived in great old ages, but it was homemade. It didn't have the sulfates and the nitrates. Yeah, and but it had all the stuff on have, its feet. Yeah, it was low sugar, you know. It didn't have, and he didn't stop the grapes. too. Yeah, he did. So everybody's different. That's what I'm telling you. So the recommendations for quantity would definitely depend on your health risks and conditions and current, current circumstances. And some of it is getting to know your body. Like, if you don't drink for a while, like we just got done with the 28 day cleanse and suddenly, you know, your people told us they lost weight and their bloating was down and their, you know, depression was better and they slept good and their joint pain was gone and their skin looked clear. And then say they reintroduce wine, for example, and they're like, okay, I'm like groggy, my gut is killing me. You know, then we're like, okay, maybe that's not something that you need to add back or that needs to be a special occasion only kind of a food. You know, your body will tell you. Once it gets in balance and it's cleaned out and feeling good, when you put something back in that it doesn't agree with, you'll get a much clearer answer. You know, the body's like, eh, I say eject, right? <laughs> out, out with it. Uh, <laughs> stress. We actually, when you guys come in, the first test we do on you is a stress test. So when you were wearing that belt around your middle, remember you laid down and you stood up? We were actually measuring the health effects or the accumulated effects that stress has had on your body. And the reason we do that is because we know stress has been linked to every major disease out there. But we just kind of, with knowing that, we just brush that fact under the rug, don't we? So like, yes, yeah, stress, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not as stressed out as Nancy down the street or you know, my family's not on Jerry Springer, so I must be doing okay. I'm doing better than the average American. Or the other, we've got people like, oh, I thrive on stress. Like, I couldn't get anything done if it wasn't for stress. I definitely, like, work better under pressure, right? Okay, well, for how long? Like, quantify that, right? We don't know until it's the straw that broke the camel's back. Like, suddenly the body's like, enough. And if we don't listen to the small, subtle signs, then eventually the body just crashes. And then we have some major upset or emergency type situation or major setback to our health. So it's like if we didn't just put ourselves on house arrest and take a break and a mental health day and take vacation and rest and treat our bodies right and eat the right foods and all, the body will revolt against you. Has anybody ever had that happen? Yes. Yeah, and then suddenly you're like, oh, I wish I, I kind of saw this coming kind of a thing, but I didn't listen, right? So. Your body will put you on time out if you don't do something sooner. So stress is super important, and it's really hard to know how stressed out we are. The reason that it's so difficult to understand our stress levels is because the body will compensate for stress, sometimes for years or even decades, right? It will get us through the stressful event, but it's relying on stress hormones to do that. And all the while, while we're depleting our stress hormones, Remember how I said all the other hormones are interconnected and interrelated? So it's depleting your adrenals, and then it's depleting your thyroid, and then your blood sugar's going out of whack, and then the liver gets involved, right? And so it's causing like this full body cascade, but nobody's telling you that it's your stress levels, right? So stress is super important, and I just encourage people to kind of tune into that, and I'm like preaching to the choir. I'm right there with all of you guys. like. I'm a type A personality, I'm a workaholic. If you don't know me yet, like I absolutely love what I do and have passion and want to bring it to everybody on the planet and go around and drive myself crazy and work myself into the ground to get the message out there. 
But like sometimes you have to take a rest and you need to listen to friends and family and relatives. They'll put you in your place. They know when you're stressed, don't they? Yeah, they'll tell you. You have to listen. <laughs> so right along with stress is sleep deprivation. You know, that can definitely impact our hormones. People always say like, oh, I'll just catch up on my sleep on the weekends. So what the research shows you is you can't actually catch up on your sleep. So the accumulated effects of years and years of sleep deprivation um, it's, it's very critical to our health factors. So what the research all agrees, there's lots of different studies, but what they agree is that we, most people need between seven and nine hours of sleep every night. And we're talking about good under, in, uninterrupted sleep. Anybody get that? <laughs> no hands went up in the house. <laughs> I strive for it. Like we could try to go to bed by 10 every night. I set my alarm for five, so that's seven. As long as like, nobody wakes me up. Um, weight definitely is a factor. So the weight around the middle, we talked about cortisol and stress hormones, but it also is, puts you at more um, exposure for estrogen, and that's men and women. And so we talked about estrogen is linked to a lot of different cancers. That's why we talk about avoiding growth hormone and foods that aren't organic, as well as soy. You know, the, the verdict's still out there about whether soy is a healthy food or not, um, I've had people who um, are proponents of soy, and I'm like, if there's the slightest risk for it to increase your estrogen, why bother? Like, there's plenty of foods out there. There's plenty of other milk alternatives out there. And most of the soy also is genetically modified and super processed. So I just say, like, take a soybean, like an edamame. Do you guys know what that looks like, right? And how do you get it into a white, slippery, rectangle. That's a lot of processing, right? So what would be better always is to eat food in its God-given natural form. So eat the dang edamame then if you have to eat soy. <laughs> Don't take the tofu. Um, and what they also said is, you know, soy in its whole food form is better, you know, because it has all the cofactors and all of the enzymes and other ingredients that will allow your body to process and digest the soy. I still would do it in moderation or minimally. Mm -hmm. um, exercise. So exercise will make you look good and make your pants feel better and make your self-esteem and confidence go up, which we said are all libido zappers. But there's a lot to be said for exercise will increase growth hormone, which will help the other hormones. Exercise will help you burn the excess fat, which has stores estrogen in it. Um, it will help, it's a stress outlet. So if your body is stressed beyond belief and you don't even know that you're stressed out, you know, getting um, exercise. I think what we talked about at one of the classes, like move your body like three times a day for 30 minutes. That's not that difficult. I, um, I told you guys, like I'm a stressed out workaholic work myself into the ground, love it. Um, I was making all the excuses, like because the practice like doubled overnight, I'm like, I can't find any time, I already get up at five, I don't get home until eight, like when in the world am I gonna exercise? And I just let this little record player keep playing in my head. But all the while, like I was getting more fatigued, I was putting on the, the inner, inner, what do you call it? Inner tube around the middle, you know, I wasn't sleeping as well, like I had body aches and pains, I mean, I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm supposed to be an example to you guys. Well, it was my 40th birthday is coming up, and so that, whatever reason, lots of reasons, triggered me, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, I cannot, I'm gonna be in the best shape of my life, and the best health of my life when I turn 40, not feel like I forsake my own body for the sake of others, or, you know, for work. And so I started working out, and what do you know? Like, I found the time, because I scheduled it. And so three times a week, I go and work out with Stephanie Lincoln, Captain Lincoln, who create, created Fireteam Whiskey, the bars and keto shakes that we have in the office. And, you know, three months later, like, my inner tube is shrinking. I do have muscles under here, if you're wondering. Um, I feel better, like, almost immediately, like, aches and pains are gone. Energy is better. Sleeping through the night. And I'm, like, so mad at myself. Like, why am I so stubborn? Like, why didn't I just do this sooner, you know? But we have these record players that go, and all the excuses in the world would come up for me. And I'm 
like, wow, I found time. So I get home a half an hour later, big deal, or I get up a half an hour earlier. And it's only 30 minutes three times a week. So I highly recommend Stephanie. Her information's out there. She has personalized programs. Like I choose to work out with her one-on-one -on -one because it's super fun and I like spending time with her. Um, and I like the hand-holding and the accountability. But she even has like online subscriptions that you guys can get and do in the comfort of your own home with minimal equipment. And it's the high intensity stuff that they're talking about that you do like intervals. And so what I also love about it is that it's only 30 second intervals, right? So like they might be having you do this crazy movement or something and you're feeling like uncomfortable or out of breath, but you're like, okay, it's 30 seconds, who cares? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it kind of helps with like your own um, success in your brain too. So I highly recommend it. There's all sorts of research online about why high intensity is good for some of these hormone issues that we're talking about and for burning fat and increasing performance and increasing mental clarity and that kind of stuff. And it's H-I-I-T is how you spell HIIT. And so there's a lot of medications. Does anybody ever look at, if you are on medications, have you ever actually read the insert for those side effects? Why scary is he? He's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so you just don't read him? Yeah, I know. You put like a blind eye to it. Well, if you read it, you would know that low libido is a is a side effect of statins, birth control, antidepressants, antihistamines, glaucoma meds, beta blockers, which is a blood pressure medication, anti-anxiety meds anti-seizure meds, hair loss medications, prostate medications, nerve pain medications, medical marijuana. Oh, shucks. Oh, shucks. <laughs> we always lose somebody on that one, right? All these mess with your hormones? Yeah. Opioids, so pain relievers, well, you're like comatose, so I mean, who cares, right? <laughs> if you're on pain meds, you don't really care if you get touched, right? Yeah. You're just like, whatever. Um, Oxycontin is in there. Um, Percocet is in there. So your meds, if you opened them and read them, could be the cause of your libido issues and hormone imbalance. Um, insecticides are on there. So that's a big one in Florida. Like, it's really hard to not have exposure to pesticides and insecticides because if you're not, the bugs, like, take over all your living and work spaces. They're crazy here. In New York, we have bugs, too, but for some reason, they don't come in your house. Like, they stay in nature where they were supposed to be. They don't try to infiltrate every room in your house. Why would a bug do do that? Why would a big old honking thing try to come inside through, like, a it's tiny more little comfortable hole? There. It's more comfortable. We should make our homes uninhabitable, then. <laughs> like, I'm not a good host. Um, but we do that with our bodies too, right? We make our bodies a good host and make it super comfortable for the bugs to live in us. Did you realize that? No. Yeah, parasites are just one example, but yeast overgrowth, um, bacterial imbalance in the gut, for sure. So we can't be good hosts. Do you know why you make a good home for critters? Sugar! Oh, sugar! Oh, sugar! Sugar! What is everybody going to get everybody for Valentine's Day? Sugar. It is not the gift of love or passion, people. <laughs> Skip it! <laughs> no Valentine's Day chocolates. Of or soap. red lipstick. Of or alcohol. <laughs> Salt lick. <laughs> Salt lick. I love it. And it actually would help improve your adrenal function, which would uh, balance your hormones, which could give you better libido. So you're onto something. You could put your stamp on there. And then I'd be trying to make love to deer. Deer? Yeah. And horses. <laughs> and horses. Well, you know what? <laughs> you knew it had to get awkward at some point. You're going to have to libido loco class. <laughs> But it can be fun to talk about this. You know, sometimes if we bring a little humor to it, suddenly it clicks. Like, we live in a mad world, you guys. Like, some of the stuff that's been shoved down our throats is true. So if we just pick it apart a little bit and start having a conversation and talk about it, like, 
put this stuff in our brains? Like, who sold us this? Who brainwashed us into believing all this stuff? So sometimes we just shake you up a little bit to get you thinking and just ask questions, you know? Ask. It's okay to ask. People are afraid to offend somebody. They don't want to go to their doctor and, you know, you know, be a non-compliant patient or have it marked in their record that they refused care or medication. Who cares? What does that mean? Just find a doctor who's willing to work with you. That's all. You have choices. You know how many doctors are out there? And enlightened ones who actually will work alongside of a nutritionist. We have patients go all the time to their medical doctors and show them how great they're doing and provide the evidence and proof through their blood work and through their testing and the improvement that they don't need medication anymore or that they need less medication. And the doctor has to decrease it because they're doing better. And they tell them, oh, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. That might not recommend it as a first choice, but they will work with you guys. Okay, and then chlorine. So that's the other hard thing in Florida. Chlorine and pesticides. Chlorine is in our water. In Florida, you guys have chloramines in addition to chlorine. And so they're actually, they don't smell. They've taken the chlorine type of smell, the bleachy smell, out of the water by using chloramines. So you think that the water's safer, but chloramines are actually more dangerous and more toxic than chlorine alone. And normal filters don't take it out. Um, so the foods that you can get, has anybody ever heard that oysters are an aphrodisiac? Yeah. It's actually true. It is? Yeah. You know what else is? Bananas, but... <laughs> bananas are really high glycemic index fruit. So, like, maybe on Valentine's Day you can do chocolate-covered bananas <laughs> or something. But you shouldn't have a banana in your smoothie every single day, you guys. It's a lot of sugar, especially to start your day off. And if you're doing keto, a banana can actually kick you straight out of keto. Um, bell peppers, truffles, I'm not talking about chocolate truffles, I'm, I'm so <laughs> excited, <laughs> no, <laughs> do you guys know what a real truffle is? No, yeah, it's a, it's a mushroom, yeah, they have to have the certain pigs go and like dig them out of the ground and all that, and they're like, cost a fortune, oh, they're unbelievably, super expensive. concentrated yeah. flavor, and they're delicious. Uh, see how excited I got over truffles? <laughs> <laughs> celery, that's super easy. Is anybody doing celery juicing in the oh. morning? It's not a bad. <laughs> it's terrible. It's you all it? strings. <laughs> oh, just the celery itself? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's all strings. We're talking about celery juicing, though. So you put it in the juicer and drink the celery juice. I thought it was going to be so disgusting. I was like, okay, here we go. I'm like, oh. And then I'm like, Oh, it's actually like super mild flavor, mm -hmm. and it's kind of sweet and around real the turn mellow. Of, around the turn it's of nice. the century, yeah. particularly in uh, Eastern European neighborhoods, sure. they had Dr. Brown celery tonic. Oh, cool. Well, people Something have known for it. years, so we did all this research, like how are they saying that celery juice like cures everything? And it's because of the salt in the celery. The salt? The salt. Oh. You know how like celery salt is a seasoning? So these yeah. celery salts go in and like break up inflammation and chronic congestion and free up the organs and, and it's just powerful for everything. Not only the digestive system, but like cellular healing in general. So that's why they're making all these medical claims. Yeah, people will drink it every single day. Okay. It's not bad at all. It takes a lot of celery to do, to make to like, <laughs> they recommend like anywhere from four to eight ounces in general. You can do more than that, but. Um, it takes a lot of celery. So, I know, I cheat and go to Earth Fair, and I'm like, can I have a celery juice? And they're like, just celery? I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> We're going to shop. Oh, they like squeeze up the celery <laughs> in the machine. <laughs> I'm like, nobody else can have celery today, because I got it all. <laughs> but it's actually nice, and what I'm reading with some of the research is that you don't want to, like some people put a little bit of green apple or something to kind of sweeten right. it or make it more palatable, but it's more effective if you do it straight without anything else in it. What about lemon juice? No lemon in it? Um, oh, in the celery juice? Yeah, what I've read so far says do straight celery. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
watermelon. So watermelon is interesting because, again, it is a higher glycemic indexed fruit, meaning it has higher sugar or raises the blood sugar, but it's actually a lot of research in anti-cancer medicine, and we have it in the test kit. So we have, like, chronic illness test kits to kind of see what matches with people to, you know, help kind of arrest some of these inflammatory processes, and watermelon's in the kit regardless of it being a high glycemic fruit. Um, asparagus sexy, right? Yes. Macy's so sexy. <laughs> uh, chocolate is actually on there. Yay! That's why we gave you chocolate covered strawberries. <laughs> so if you're going to eat your chocolate, you have to do it responsibly and get good quality organic chocolate. Okay? Dark. The darker the better because the more dark the chocolate, the lower the sugar. Yeah? And what you also could do is get really good high quality dairy-free, sugar-free cocoa or cacao powder, and you can make your own chocolate. So you can use coconut butter and coconut oil um, or coconut cream. There's all recipes online. You can put make Mexican chocolate and put some cinnamon and some hot pe cayenne pepper in there. You can put little nuts and seeds. You could put peppermint oil. You can put orange oil in it. You can do whatever you want. I'm make it whatever make flavor. Chocolate. You can make your own chocolate. And also I recommend looking up um, what I'm explaining to you, like with the coconut oil and the coconut cream in it, is um, they're called fat bombs. So that's part of the keto world is to, as a, you know, attempt to try to get more fat in the diet, healthy fats. So if you go online and research fat bombs, you'll find peanut butter flavored one and chocolate flavored one and that maca bombs. green tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's dangerous. <laughs> boom. Never Explosion. They're great. And you keep them in the fridge because coconut oil melts at room temperature or in your hand. So you kind of take them out like 10 minutes before you want to eat them just so they get a little bit room temperature. And they're amazing and that's a good thing to help satisfy a sweet craving as well as um, hunger so if you get some fat well, usually if you think you're hungry if you get some fat in your in your stomach and let it sit for a minute you'll realize you're full so everybody thinks they need carbs like oh what am I gonna eat if I can't eat carbs I'm gonna be so hungry without carbs carbs don't last you guys it'll make you feel full and bloated and heavy which you are you know thinking that's fullness and then you burn it, and then you're hungry immediately right after, like an hour later. But if you put fat in your body, it actually sustains you longer. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So our friend Stephanie, who's the keto expert out there, talks about a match versus a candle. And she says that a match, you know how you strike it and it quick burns? That's like a carbohydrate versus if you light a candle and it's a slow burn. That's a keto. That's a fat burning. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So you want to be a candle, not a match. Garlic is super sexy. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing with garlic is if you eat it, then your spouse or partner has to eat it too, because then you both smell. Avocado, so healthy fats, and any of the healthy fats, grass-fed butter, coconut oil, olive oil, tuna, salmon, sardines, so all those types of foods. So now hopefully you've got an entree, you've got an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert mm -hmm. idea for your Valentine's meal, right? We right. can see the wheels are turning. <laughs> and then if you flip to the last page, these are foods that balance hormones. So the number one thing that we wanted to talk to you on this was fiber. Fiber is not all that easy to get in your diet. So we went to this, um, we went to Orlando, me and Charlie, one of the associates here, and uh, they talked about the microbiome. Does that, you guys know what the microbiome is? So it's the diversity of bacteria that live in your gut, which is unique to everybody. Like it's like the same as like a thumbprint, but it's your bacteria. And they talked about like how your microbiome rules the whole world, like your preferences and what you taste and even like the people that you like and what you're attracted to and your health and all these other things. But they were talking about, you know, the whole probiotic world, right? Everybody's like, oh, you have to eat yogurt and fermented, yogurt and fermented foods and get probiotics and taking probiotic supplements by the handful and everything. Well, what we know is that it's actually the amount of fiber that you get, the fiber content that you get in your food, um, 
that will enable the good bacteria to live and survive in the gut. So they have to have a food source, and the fiber is their food source. So there's a lot of reasons why people have gut imbalances, but fiber is one thing that you can add to your diet. So fruits and vegetables have a lot of fiber. If you're trying to lose weight, you wanna do more veggies than fruit because of the sugar content. Um, but women need to get like at least 30 grams a day and men a little bit more, 40 grams of fiber. Quantify that to me, cups. It depends on the food. Like you actually have to look up how much fiber is in. Um, like uh, chia seeds have a ton of fiber. So you could add chia to your protein shake or chia. to your smoothies or drinks. Yeah, chia, they get like slimy. They absorb a lot of water. So they're actually a good way to get hydration and omega-3s in your diet as well. Um, some lettuce has like zero. Have you ever heard like people say that like, oh, you gotta eat a salad to get your fiber. Well, you actually have to add like pine nuts or other nuts and seeds and have a, quite a variety of vegetables that are in your salad to have it amount to any kind of fiber. And so like iceberg lettuce has like no fiber. So you'd have to eat like spinach and radicchio and some of those ones that you have to like actually chew a little bit. What about romaine? Crunch. You about romaine? I know I looked it up once upon a time. It did not have as much as I thought. Like oh. some were like two grams. I'm like, okay, it's cool. I got 28 to go. <laughs> so what I found is you really have to purposefully add fiber, whether it's chia seeds or nuts and seeds or more fruits and vegetables to the foods that you're eating in order to get fiber in. Um, what I found is that I actually had to add, I add um, the standard processed fiber to my shake every morning. And I add, um, we have a few, whole food fiber, gastro fiber, and then there's also a prebiotic inulin. So inulin, you'll see inulin in a lot of products in chicory. And I never had like, people think like you only need to have fiber if you're having trouble using, um, moving your bowels every day, but everybody needs fiber and fiber actually helps absorb toxins and it actually helps absorb excess hormones in the body. So your body detoxes excess hormones through the gut and if you can put enough fiber in there, it'll absorb it and help move it up. Can you do like a Metamucil or a green fiber? Yeah, um, some of the fibers like the Metamucil, most of the over-the-counter fiber is psyllium husk and it can be very irritating and bloaty and gassy. So most people don't do very good with some of those. I know I have patients that tolerate them well. What I just suggest is bring it in. Like if you have fiber and you wanna know if it works good for you, bring it in and we'll muscle test it during your office visit. Yeah, so you don't have to guess on that stuff too. Sometimes we have patients like buy stuff and don't open it and bring it in and test it first and then make sure you keep the receipt so you can return it in case it doesn't test well. So you're always welcome to do that. Or we could just test you, you know, on, save you all that hassle and just test you on something that's tried and true that we trust, you know. Um, healthy fats, we beat that too, a bloody pulp. Um, you need healthy fats. Antioxidants, um, dark green leafy vegetables are a really good high source of antioxidants. And um, standard process, some people have bowel disorders, so they can't eat all the fiber that we're talking about, you know, or have disrupted GI issues. And so sometimes you do better to take some supplementation while we're working on rebuilding the gut and getting you to the point where you will be able to digest the extra fiber. So um, one of the things that we do for antioxidants would be increase the frisk complete, which is a bunch of greens just in a capsule. Um, clean proteins, so we talked about making sure that your animal proteins are organic and grass-fed. They don't have the growth hormones and the pesticides that cause libido or hormone issues. Um, and then nuts and seeds and beans, um, soaked or sprouted. So there's a whole world out there about high lectin and people that can't digest the outer coatings of some of these um, nuts and seeds. And so if you soak them, or eat the sprouted version, or cook them in a pressure cooker, like the Instant Pot, that will handle it for most people. Um, people are reading a lot of this information about lectins. I think that there's validity in it, there's a lot of truth, but I think that not everybody's the same. And so, all the nuts and seeds and legumes are in our test kits. So if you've already been on a nutrition program, you've been tested to see if that's something that your body can handle, and if that's a good protein source for you or not. 
So unless we told you that's on your food elimination list, you're good on those. Um, spices and herbs. So spices and herbs, like when we were just on the purification, we always encourage people to try to add these things to their cooking routine because it's like a non-fat, non low-calorie, preservative-free way of adding flavor and dimension to your foods. But in a lot of like Ayurvedic and Indian type of cooking, they put the foods in there not just for flavor, but for the health proponents. And they know how to blend the herbs for anti-inflammation and to encourage proper digestion and to warm you or to cool you depending on what your body, body type would be. And it's delicious, right? I know, I love it. So things that you can incorporate, cinnamon. I put cinnamon in my shake every single morning. Cinnamon actually helps manage blood sugar, which will help you with the weight around the middle. Um, Turmeric is very anti-inflammatory. Cayenne boosts metabolism and helps with circulation. So remember we talked about a lot of the side effects of the medical approach to libido and hormone imbalances is geared more towards the circulatory effects, right? So cayenne would be something that would increase that. Um, cumin, garlic, and ginger are all good endocrine support. And again, if you can't tolerate these or you just don't simply like the flavor, then there are um, some of the standard process products. These actually are all in their Medi Herb lineup, which is their herbal line from Australia, is Boswellia, uh, Garlic Forte, and Cayenne, just to name a couple. And those are all things that we would test you on regularly anyway during your normal program. So I think you're kind of getting it. The real solution would be to get educated on the foods that you're eating, on the labels, and the things that you're keeping in your pantry, and the labels also on the um, products that you're putting on and in your body as far as personal care. Um, we gave you a couple of resources here so you can start looking those up. Um, EWG.org we send people to, which is the Environmental Workers Group. You can look up, um, they have some things registry in a barcode where you can scan the barcode and it'll give you a safety rating as far as carcinogenic or estrogen or endocrine disruptors. Those are all categories and then some other things too, just like tox, you know, overall toxicity and what the chemicals do in the body. It tells you why it was rated that way. Um, if you can't find the barcode, you can look up the specific ingredients. So if you're like reading a label and you're like, how did that get in there? <laughs> you know, um, you can look up those items individually too. And they have an app called Skin Deep App. That's where you can scan the barcodes. We talked about swapping out your containers for glass or ceramic and ditching the plastic water bottles. I don't mind. These we get, um, the, you can either get um, glass water bottles or like the stainless steel or aluminum bottles and they're not reactive. Uh, laundry detergent, there's petroleum in a lot of that, so swapping that out for a natural laundry detergent. There's chemical-free versions that are just enzyme cleaners that break down the oils and the bacteria in, the, um, you know, in your clothing and towels and bedding. Um, using chlorine-free paper products and hygiene products, whether it's tampons or pads, toilet paper, paper towel, coffee filters, those are some of the areas where some of the stuff hides that you might not think about it. And they have the unbleached version of all of the above. They have version varieties that are cotton, that are organic, and they're easy to find, you know, in all of our local grocery stores. Um, avoiding stimulants, so that would be like caffeine. That's mm -hmm. the reason why um, chocolate is on some of the lists that you don't realize because it does have caffeine in it. So a lot of times we're like, oh, do you drink caffeine? And people are like, no, I don't take energy drinks. No, I don't drink coffee. No, I don't drink tea. But they might be eating chocolate and not realizing that it's a stimulant. So chocolate's not a good thing to eat at night because it can interrupt your sleep. Even though I do like um, sleep, getting sufficient rest. If you guys are in the crowd that has trouble with sleep, um, we do have a sleep lecture on our YouTube channel. Did everybody know that you can access all our past lectures right on YouTube? Okay, so the easiest way to get to any of our previous classes is right up here. If you go to our website, which is healthbydesignfl.com, right on the upper right-hand corner on the homepage is all of our social media icons. 
So if you just click the YouTube, it'll take you right over to our channel. We always recommend that you subscribe to it, like follow the channel. So every time we upload a new lecture, like tonight's lecture, will get uploaded within a week so that you can go back and watch it. Or if you try to invite somebody tonight and they couldn't make it, you could still send them the link to it so they can still get the valuable information. Um, and then what we do is we put the lecture notes for the most um, recent over here in this um, magazine rack in our waiting room. So you can always grab those when you're in the office and then go to the YouTube channel and have the notes in front of you so that you can take additional notes right on it. Because I don't always, I don't follow the script all the time. Did you notice that? <laughs> He's like, no. I, I might say something totally different when I give this lecture next time. I just don't know where it's going to lead me. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on you guys, the audience. It just depends on who I'm talking to, what comes out of my mouth, you know? That's <laughs> totally true. Uh, where are we? Sleep, chlorine. So, you know, for 20 or $30, you guys can go to a Lowe's or Home Depot or one of your local suppliers and just get a simple um, charcoal shower head filter, and that will eliminate a lot of the chlorine out of your water. Um, it's the equivalent of eight ounces of chlorinated water that you absorb when you shower because you're all warm and your pores are open. So mm -hmm. we don't think about that, but we're absorbing water through our skin. Um, essential oils in place of perfumes, air fresheners, cleaners, you know, we're just another, that's one of those social things that we talked about. We think that we have to like reek like perfume to be sexy for some reason, which is totally not sexy when it stimulates somebody to have a headache and start gasping for air and, you know, stimulates an asthma attack. That's not sexy. It's not going to put you in here. Yeah. If they're the one gasping for air, right? I get it. But not if it happens to you. So a lot of our patients, we test for chemicals, are chemically sensitive, you know? So there's things that you could do if you like pretty smelling stuff. There's all sorts of essential oils and natural things that you can use in your air, in your cars, in your laundry, on your person, in your mouth, whatever and you're trying to mask the odor of. Um, and the same for chemical-free soaps and toothpastes. We talked about the high-intensity exercise, the interval training. Um, eating clean. So if you're hanging out with us, mm, we're going to talk about nutrition in every single one of our classes and every single one of your appointments. So we're going to help you navigate the crazy world of nutrition. We should say like Nutrition Loco is our next class because that will make you crazy too. We should just put the word loco on every single class that we do, right? Because I'm crazy or because the topic is crazy. Um, using adaptogenic herbs. So there's herbs that we test for in the office as well that help your body handle stress. That's what adaptogenic means. So stress happens, but we're going to build up your ability to handle and adapt to it so it's not, it doesn't cause these major disruptions and setbacks. Um, detox. So the 21-day and 28-day purification de um, programs through standard process. Um, we just did a big group cleanse in January, and uh, um, some people did it in the group, and we met once a week, um, and then other people did it solo, so they just did it from home, and Standard Process has amazing resources for that. They have a beautiful program guide, um, recipes, a downloadable or hardcover cookbook. We have emails that we can subscribe you to that, you know, for all the 21 days, it'll send you a little personalized message about what to do and experience and it's just, a, it's really a great program because 21 days is enough time to make a habit. So whether that's stocking your pantry or reading labels or how to shop or, you know, incorporating some new recipes into your day to day, um, but also helping your body with the food cravings and the sugar addictions and changing your palate and getting the inflammation out of the body and handling some of those like habitual things. It's great. Um, so that's like a huge thing for any kind of hormone balance. There's some offices across the country that they won't even start patients on a program until they complete the 21-day detox. So that's something that if you're interested, we can give you some information and you can decide if that's the right route for you to go in. Um, essential oils. There is celery oil. Um, orange oil is actually a mood enhancer and can help with libido. Um, and it's just mild. Uh, Lang Lang is really good. Clary Sage or Clary Calm is one. 
from doTERRA that we recommend and that is very hormone balancing, like women might use it cyclically. Um, there's all sorts of different essential oils. I don't know if we have the book here. There's an essential oil book that when you're here um, waiting for your appointments, that you can leaf through and look up different conditions and different recipes and how to use the different oils. There's an oil called Passion by doTERRA. So there's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, different supplements, B vitamins, zinc and tribulus. Zinc actually helps um, with fertility. It helps with hormone production. And uh, tribulus is an herb that is like, I can't say that. <laughs> How can I say it correctly? It actually is good for um, like male enhancement. It works a little bit more for women. Um, it look, works better for men. For women, it's just kind of more of a general tonic for the endocrine system. For men, it actually is more of a libido enhancer. And it'll help with hormone balance. So it's not just a symptomatic type of thing like the over-the-counter medications um, or prescription medications. And then, of course, when in doubt, we say get tested, you know, so if you're starting to read through some of this and have some of these symptoms or you're curious about the health of your adrenals or your thyroid or how it might be all kind of coming together, um, we'd encourage you to get tested. If you're already a patient, you know, mention some of these things. I think sometimes people are afraid to put it on their initial paperwork or embarrassed or they don't even think to put it on there because they don't think it's anything that we can even help with. So, um, yeah, talk to us. We're all easy, approachable. I always tell people this is a non-judgment zone. Like, when you come here, we're here to help you. We're not going to make a big deal out of anything. We'll take everything in stride and really help you get to the underlying root of whatever the imbalance is. Um, any questions for me? That's going to end, like, the official lecture. Um, anybody, while I'm taking questions, anybody who wants to experience muscle testing who hasn't yet been muscle tested, um, we always allow the guests to experience it. Um, so if you do want that, in the back of your yellow folder, the last sheet would be your public education worksheet. So we just ask you to fill out your contact information before we'll take you back. And then, you know, any, um, there's a list to put some of your health concerns just so we can have a brief conversation. And then I'll take you back one at a time to do the muscle testing. But any questions that I can answer? You're all libido experts? Cool, you can go plan your menu, get some of the items. Don't buy the people you love chocolate and perfume. And God bless, have a great night. Thank you. You're welcome.